Josh Rojas grew up in Litchfield Park and was just a little leaguer when the Diamondbacks won the World Series in 2001. It was a franchise seemingly as old as he was and already world champions. As a boy, Rojas admired speedy infielders like Tony Womack and Orlando Hudson, his favorite players. Years later, after he was drafted by Houston and then not long afterward traded to the Diamondbacks, Josh suddenly found himself filling the shoes of his boyhood heroes. The first time I realized it when I was in Reno, I was sitting in the dugout before the game and I saw the D-backs patch on the sleeve. And that's when I was like, dang, that's kind of sick. Like this is, this is the <laughs> patch, you know, even though it was a minor league uniform, we had the patch and I had worn the patch as a fan. And I was like, dang, this would be sick if I get to wear it for real. And then 10, 12 days later, they're all right, you're going to the big leagues. I remember that day because it was in Colorado. I remember taking a picture, in fact, you and your family right there yeah. down on the field. And you had two hits that day and knocked it around. Yeah, I did. It was awesome. Yeah. You know, and I, I still remember the first one was like the lefty slider. I was out front and squeaked it up the middle. Up the middle and throw. Josh Rojas has got his first major league hit. I always thought in the minor leagues, like, I want my first hit to be cool. Like, I hate seeing the ones that's like, you know, infield chopper and he beats it out. And I did, I wanted it to be cool. So, and I'd always joke <laughs> that like, if it's gonna be an infield single, I'd rather just be an out so that the first one's cool. But then I got that first little squibble and I'm like, oh my, I don't care what it is. <laughs> it's out of the way. I feel good now. You know, I'm not gonna be picky, I'll take it. So where's the ball? I think it's at my parents' house. You think? Yeah, I, I, I gave so, it to them. It sounds like they deserve it. Yeah, 100%. Absolutely. You know, they put in just as much, if not more work than I did, you know getting to where I'm at. So yeah, they deserve all the credit in the world. Litchfield Park, what, growing up there, what was that like? It was awesome. I moved, small neighborhood, but I moved there in fourth grade, fourth or fifth grade. Mm -hmm. It was perfect. Right down the street from the Little League field where I played, rode my bike there to go to practice, go to games. It was good. It's good, small community, quiet. I love it, I'm still there. Do you still live there? Yeah, I'm still. Are you living at home? No, so I got a house in the same neighborhood as my parents, and that's in. How Lichfield about Park. that? Yeah, that's pretty cool. What yep. What made you decide to do that? I love it on that side. Uh, I think it's quiet. My friends are still over there. Like high school buddies? Yeah, all my high school buddies, all my family there, my friends, my grandparents, my grandma, my uncle, um, my which is my mom's twin brother. Uh, we're all still in the same area. So. Wow. So the yeah. whole gang is still together. Yeah, we're all still on the west side. Do you have a, an awareness or a sense of how unusual that is or how fortunate yeah. you have it in that it, regard? It's been crazy, you know, from, from being traded to the hometown to now having a house in my neighborhood where I grew up, driving to the ballpark every day. It's, it's really crazy. It's really crazy to think about. Okay, so you're at one point a kid on a bike riding to the Little League field. Fast forward about 10 years, 15 years. Now you're a big leaguer in a car driving from the same place to go play in a major league game every day. Holy cow. Yeah, it's nuts. It it's is nuts. nuts. It's, That's amazing. Uh, I mean, I grew up playing here year round baseball. You know, it was nonstop with my parents and they were the ones driving me to all those games all across Arizona playing everywhere. Tucson, Scottsdale, Peoria, Surprise. Now they're driving to my games at Chase. You know, it's, it's crazy. <laughs> Do they go? A lot? They every home game they're here. Yeah. Do they where, where do they sit? They're in the suite, the family oh, suite well, up here. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> so they got the family suite. It's actually funny. So at first they didn't like it because it was too far from the, you know, it's yeah. you're up pretty high and sure. it's not the same view as being down where they were in 19. So first they didn't like it, but then when they were allowed to sit in the stands again, they did, and my dad was like, ah, it's, I'm a nervous wreck down there now. You know, living hearing all the fans say what they want to say and you know they're they're cheering for and against some of the guys and he's like I think I like it up where all the families are it's safer and nobody's yelling and there's not pressure and you know because he he lives and dies with every pitch just like I do he's just as competitive as I am and that's where I got it so he's sweating out every AB huh? oh yeah 100 percent so they were they were those parents they were the ones that every morning practice every road trip the whole thing they did all that oh yeah they were uh, my dad was actually our my travel ball coach and we were a close-knit team i'm still talking to some of those guys like we were we were that same team we weren't like those little travel ball teams where like every year you're getting new guys you know we yeah. we were the same team from nine until we all got to high school and then had to go to our high school team so it was wow. a lot of fun 
How were you able to keep that group together? Or how did he do that? I think it was just the, the, the type of team we were running. I think a lot of teams were all about performance and winning tournaments. And a lot of the coaches were about making money. And that, you know, because that, that is a very good There's a shady income. side of it. Yeah, there is. Yeah. My dad saw the opportunity and my mom saw the opportunity. Okay, let's take this team and, and make it fun. You know, make it for the kids. And so what that's a concept. What, exactly. And, uh, and so that's what we did. We, my dad started up a new team. And then once we started it, it was, you paid your dues strictly for the tournament. My dad wasn't getting paid. Nobody was making any money. We were a nonprofit, so we allowed donations. And we strictly, all you paid for was your hundred bucks to pay and play the tournament. And then that was it. So I think that's why a lot of the families loved it. We carried 10 guys. We didn't have 15, 20 guys on the team. So everybody was playing. And, uh, and we were winning. So I think that was uh, the best part about that team and why everybody stayed so close knit. Whether it's the Cardinals, the D-backs now, which I get to be a part of, or the Suns. I want, my, I want to be able to brag that my hometown teams are winning or are winners. So that's where I want to be. So you're a Valley native and really maybe the first generation that grew up with the Diamondbacks as a team here. You're a product of that sort of first wave of what we hope to be generational D-back fans. Yeah. What difference, if any, does that make to you playing for the team now? It's been really cool, you know, coming to the games growing up, watching the growth of the team, the falls of the team, you know, those, I, I want to be a part of this team coming back and being good again. And that's what I want to do is win. I hate losing more than anybody. And more than losing, I hate when a, my hometown teams are not playing well, whether it's the Cardinals, the D-backs now, which I get to be a part of, or the Suns. I want, my, I want to be able to brag that my hometown teams are winning or are winners. So that's where I want to be. Hey, it's gone. Josh Rojas. So in 2001, when you were a kid growing up, you were Seven, eight-ish? Seven, yeah. Seven. Who was your guy? Tony Womack. Was, uh, I was a big fan of Womack. You know, just the, the scrappy guys. The, yeah. yeah. The, and that's, so I was actually, so my dad's 5'9", five, 5'8". Five, I think he's 5'8". We'll give him 5'9". We'll give him 5'9". Yeah. Or television. So, you know, growing up, and I was always, always a smaller kid. And so growing up, I always thought I was going to be, I didn't know I was going to be 6'1". So... That was the guys I looked up to, the scrappy base hits, you know, the second basemen are mm -hmm. the guys I looked up to. Even Ichiro was, he was one of my first favorite players growing up, was Ichiro, just slap hitter, tons of base hits, steel bases, cannon from, the, from right field. So with the D-backs, my guy was Tony Womack. He was scrappy. You know, everybody, a lot of people don't talk about the hit that he had in, in the world. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was. Bob came, does all the time, believe yeah. me. Yeah, yeah that, that. For good reason. That was the one that started it off, was that, that double. You know, after that, it was O-Dog. I love Orlando Hudson. <laughs> I got a chance to meet him in spring training and work with him. He's awesome. Did you get a word in? I got a few in. <laughs> easy. Yeah, yeah. so he's, easy, uh, no. he's the guy that I imagined him to be on the way he played. You know, high energy, every day, ready to go. Steve Finley was another guy, mm -hmm. center fielder, nasty in the outfield. Um, yeah, just tons of scra scrappy guys were my guys. So when you were in high school at Millennium, there was, it wasn't just baseball, right? Soccer and football? Yeah, so I played, I mean, I was, I was playing everything. I was playing whatever I could get my hands on. If our basketball team wasn't so good, I'd, I would have played basketball too, but they were too good. But yeah, I played, uh, it was mostly baseball and football. My junior year, I played soccer because I had elbow surgery, mm -hmm. so I couldn't play football. And I, I actually tried out as a bet against one of the soccer players who, <laughs> who said that I wouldn't be able to make the team because soccer's too hard. So I, I tried out and I made it and I played the whole year. Had so. you ever played soccer? No. Did you never. understand the rules? I did from playing FIFA. Oh, duh. Yeah, so that, I played. That game's hard. Yeah. So I played FIFA all the time with my friends, and so that's how I knew the rules. And I remember, I still remember the first tryout was like 
warm ups was like 20 laps around the field. And I was big like, field. I was like, I could quit right now. I don't really care about this sport. You know, <laughs> this is awful. I hate <laughs> running. But I was like, you know what? I'm not going to, it's, I'm not going to give up just because it's running. So I wanted to come down to skill if I don't make this team, but I made it. So it was cool. What was the bet? He you, was, so it actually started. You so have to we shave a, his head or anything? No. So we had it. It was just there wasn't anything on the line. It was just pride because we had. I had a class. It was uh, it was my junior year. So we had you had weight training, which was one class, and then you had one class that was sport and PE, mm -hmm. and it was it was literally just sport. So every week we would go over the rules of the game. Uh, you know, most of the games you knew, but there were some like handball was a sport that you'd play and. You had to learn the rules and then you'd play it for a week. And then at the end of the week or sometimes two weeks, there was a championship and the winners got Gatorade or, you know, bragging rights. Cool. So one week it was arena soccer. And so we won. And one of the kids we beat was a soccer player. And so, of course, I was like saying, this is too easy. It's <laughs> too easy. You know, that talking smack, which I love to do. And he's like, this ain't real soccer. This isn't real soccer, you know, come try it on the real field and see how it is. And so I remember telling him in the locker room as we're changing after PE, I was like, if you bring me cleats, I will go to tryouts and I'll make the team. And he did, two days later, he brought me cleats and he goes, let's, and so when he brought me the cleats, I was like, man, I got it now. <laughs> you talked it's, yourself into yeah, it. Yeah, it's, it's, now it's, the floor's mine. So yeah, I went to tryouts and made the team. Hey, he's got it, Josh Rojas in right. Football, you were a receiver, right? Because I read you yeah. were a pretty well-regarded yeah, wide receiver. Football was, was really fun for me. It was, I actually had never played, I didn't get to play football until high school. Right. And my dad always told me, when I, I get to make a decision when I get to high school, but up until then, we're gonna keep it safe and you, you can play baseball. Was that okay with you? Yeah, I mean, I was bummed at the time when I didn't get to play Pop Warner. And you know, you got all the kids wearing their Pop Warner jerseys to school. and. I always felt like, man, I could do it. But when I got to high school, I was thankful because I realized how physical of a sport it is. Did your dad go to all the games and was oh, he yeah. nervous like he is for baseball? He was. He would always tell me, you know, hey, be careful. But, you know, you can't play that game careful. You got to play full speed. The second you try to, you know, halfway do something, is, I think those are the times you get hurt. <laughs> I try to spread this message as much as I can because I think it's a very big stigma and it could be a negative stigma about going division one out of high school. And I think that's the goal of every sport, of every player. That's the cool thing to do. You get out of Millennium and you're at Paradise Valley for two years? Two years, yep. What were your options coming out of high school? That obviously was the best one. What yeah, was that so process like for you? That was actually a really tough process for me. And I think I try to spread this message as much as I can because I think it's a very big stigma and it could be a negative stigma about going division one out of high school. And I think that's the goal of every sport, of every player. That's the cool thing to do. You know, right. a lot of high schools, I know our high school did have, you know, signing day where everybody gets to announce where they're signing. And you want to be D1 out of, on that day because that's cool and it's kind of, you know, that, that banner that says, I'm as good as I think I am. It's a status thing. Yeah, and that's really all it is because I've had so many buddies that out of high school went to a Division One, and they sat for two years, and then they're trying to play their junior year, and it's just too little too late. You know, you missed out on two years of development and experience because you sat behind somebody for two years, sometimes three, sometimes you never get your shot. Yeah. That was my goal out of high school was like, oh, I want to go D1 because you know, I think I'm that good. And if I want to prove to everybody that I'm that good, that's where I got to go. And so I had some talks with ASU, had some talks with U of A. So it was actually the recruiting coordinator at U of A that was kind of the most straight up with me, like saying like, we have this guy for a couple years, our middle infield stacked. Maybe you should look into the JUCO option. You know, that's a really good option for guys. And so I did, and I started meeting with junior colleges and suddenly I went from little to no money to yeah, we'll, we'll give you everything you need. And I was like, okay, this is my level right here. You know, right. I'm, getting, I'm getting top recruiting options in the junior college level, whereas D Division One, where I was trying to fit in, I was getting nothing. So I started shopping around and 
once I started shopping around and like looking, you know, going to practices and watching how guys develop, I started to see things like, okay, I've already done that. Now it's like looking at, okay, how can this team develop me so that I can get to where I want to go? And that's how I landed on Paradise Valley. I, I remember going to different practices and thinking like just standard ground ball, standard hitting and, you know, everything I've seen before, everything I've already been working on. And I went to PV's practice and I remember just seeing the, it, it, I mean, it, it looked monotonous, the work they were doing, but I was like, that's something different. I haven't done that yet. First week, no gloves, Whoa. no bats. Second week, gloves, still no bats. Third week is when we finally start getting into like, okay, now we're, but that was fundamentals is what I needed. I I'd, I'd played the game for a while now. Now it was about taking what, how I play the game and putting it into fundamentals and, and playing it right. So how'd you get to Hawaii? It was actually the JUCO All-Star Game. So, which is really cool about the junior colleges in Arizona, which I think are some of the best in the country. Um, it's a wood bat league. It's a grind of a schedule, which a lot of people don't talk about. And they also have that. So for all the freshmen that you complete a year, so it's going into your sophomore year, there's an all-star game. And it's at the same time as the fall classic, which is a big thing here in Arizona. So the fall yeah. classic is a baseball tournament where teams from all over the country come to play. There's college scouts, pro scouts. Like you play one game, there might be 50, 60 scouts behind the field watching these, these games. And our all-star game is that same weekend. So we play in front of all those same scouts and that's where they had a coach from Hawaii was there and called me up a day later and was like, hey, we saw you play in the All-Star game, had a couple hits, went on a visit, fell in love, was like, this is, Duh, it's this Hawaii. is an unbelievable Hello. atmosphere. <laughs> yeah, and I was all in from then, then on out. So there's an interesting pattern here in that throughout the course of your career, you have pick places that wanted you and that fit you and that's happened here with you the Diamondbacks traded for you did they tell you why did anybody have that conversation that they had with you at, at PV and with Hawaii hey Josh here's why we like you here's why we want you here here's why we brought you here yeah I've had that discussion uh, with Tori and Hazen it was when I don't it wasn't right when I got here I think the biggest talk we had that was most beneficial for me in my, my mental state was the, the talk we had this spring training before spring training started. What was different about that one? It was that they believed in what I could do if I would just do what I was doing. I thought I needed more power, you know, oh, I got to hit more homers, you know, I, guys in the big leagues hit homers, you know, I, I got to get more doubles and, and I was trying to play outside of myself. Mm -hmm. And we, when we had the talk in spring training, it was all about, we want you to be the guy we traded for. You know, the guy that you were being in the minor leagues, that's the guy we wanted. We didn't want to trade for you and then, oh, let's make him into something he's not. And, and when I heard that, I kind of, and I was kind of feeling it already too. You know, I was kind of feeling like, I'm getting outside of myself here. And I went into spring training and I, I broke it down to being as simple as possible. Get base hits and get on base. Cool, the spring was ridiculous. Yeah. Well, I wrote it down, 347. I mean, every time we looked up, Rojas got two more hits. Rojas got three more hits. It's in the gap, it's down the line. There goes Rojas. Yeah. I mean, it was crazy. And it was, and there was not much thought going into it. It was do my routine every day, hit the weight room, stay strong, and then go out and execute a plan. Whether, whatever that plan was that day, you know? And in spring training, there's not reports before the game. So it's, right. it's strictly, you step in the box and you're coming up with a plan on a whim. That's as simplified as it gets then. Simplified as it gets. And so you thrive that way though. Thrived, yeah, I loved it. And, and that's why there's a constant adjustment in season. And we saw that, I mean, if you look at the beginning of the year. Two for 31, two, I did. Yeah. <laughs> It That's was, what I do every day. I, it was, I will never forget. It was that first series, San Diego. I was like, okay, now, now we go. And I went in there 
The fence looked like it was about 200 feet. I was like, I'm gonna leave the yard with every, I felt good, you know, especially after the spring I had. BP felt great that day. You know, I was like, I felt like I could leave the yard with every pitch and I was facing you Darvish. Good. <laughs> You're not gonna leave the yard on every pitch. So, and I think that first game going over and seeing zeros on the board, then going to the next day and seeing more zeros on the board, you know, you just start to, oh shoot, now I gotta get, I gotta get two or three hits today to make up for it. You go the next day, oh, I gotta get two or three hits and it just snowballs. And okay. you're like, how am I gonna get out of this? Let me stop you there because I, I've had a theory with you that now finally, thanks to COVID, I have the chance to ask you. I go back to Washington, April 18th. You remember this game? You know where I'm going here? Yeah, yeah, I do. Sunday game, finale of a four game set, you're two for 31. And the thought is, well, Josh is struggling. Maybe that spring was just spring training, facing a bunch of backfield guys. Now he's in the big leagues. The water's a little deeper and he's not swimming like he was before. Lead off homer on that Sunday game. And ever since that home run, everything's different. You know what's funny about that day is that that day was actually different than all the rest of the days altogether. How? So I wasn't supposed to play that game. I had the day off that day, that game. So I'm in the weight room and, you know, getting, it's a day game. So everybody, you know, it's a Sunday, coffee, yeah. going on the road. I Sunday think we went to game. Cincinnati next or something. Yeah, I'm, I'm two for whatever, 31. So I get the off day. I'm like, this is great. I need this off day. <laughs> you know, I'm in the weight room. That, the plan for the day was just to, you know, get a light lift in, get loose. Pipe comes in. He goes, hey, uh, you're in the lineup today. I'm like, okay. So he's like, get ready. So I'm like, okay. So the whole routine changed and it was kind of, was kind of behind on everything. And so there was no, all the routines I had done, you know, all the scouting reports, you know, all the, all the stuff that I usually do before a game, none of it was done. It was all about just getting the body ready. It's spring training all over again. Spring training all over again. And so go, the approach for that day, going into that first at bat was, let's just swing at strikes, put the ball in play. And that first at bat, it was a battle. Like I was fouling off pitches. I was missing some heaters that I wanted to hit. And he left over the middle plate and I got it. And I, I never forget that swing was, it was just a swing to get a base hit and I hit it perfect for a homer. Yeah, you did. And that's when I realized like, I can hit homers with a normal swing. I don't have to try to hit a homer to hit a homer. If you look back at that at bat, it's been, all, I think you're hit, if you take out the two for 31, you're like at 290 with an 850 OPS. If you take out that first section, when you were trying to hit home runs, you're talking about all-star numbers. Yeah, that would be sick if we could do that, right? <laughs> Just go back take and out take those. Out. Yeah, that's, that, those are those waves I'm talking about. You know, take the ups yep. and the downs. The ups and the downs, and it's it's how can you mask those? How can you not let the guy on the other side know? You know, there's because there's times where I'm on defense and I see a guy hitting, and I want to go up to the pitcher and tell him like, hey man, I can see it because as a hitter we see it more than he's scrambling. Just throw him throw it over the plate he's scrambling that's interesting you know that you can see it in guys and and the main goal is to not let guys see that because you might get exposed you know I'll see it when I'm hitting hey this guy's scrambling can't throw strikes ambush him you know it's all about hiding that and riding those waves and not letting any anybody know you're going through waves well you're doing a heck of a job thank you thanks for doing this yeah it's been fun awesome